thank each and every one of you very much for attending this webinar this morning. I appreciate it. This is my LTCI 2012 What Happened. This is the full version of this webinar, and it is a webinar that I'm only going to give once a month at this point. And the reason for it is because it's fairly complex. If you are sitting in it today, do me a favor. Don't try to take notes. You can get a copy of today's slides just by going to www.ltcagentsalestools.com. You'll see all of my sales tools that I have available to agents there are free of charge. And feel free to download any of them you desire and use them. I hope that it helps you sell more long-term care. This is a real interesting speech because actually I started this speech just by looking at what happened in the last couple of years. You know, this has been a fascinating time frame. First of all, long-term care sales have been up tremendously out there. And there's a lot of good reasons for it. The aging of America is happening. The pressure on the social programs out there is forcing the government to make moves here. And it's forcing people to realize we can't depend on Medicare and Medicaid in the future like we do right now. As a result, there's been a big move towards insurance. Then you got the Philia laws coming in where more and more states now are starting to enforce their filial laws, forcing children to pay their parents' way inside of a nursing facility. As we watched all of these things occurring, it was an exciting time frame. Then all of a sudden, at the same time, though, we were seeing some things that kind of made us sit back. You know, all of a sudden, we saw players start to leave the industry. MetLife started that out. You know, if we kind of explain that away, that basically they had made a big investment over in uh, Europe and Asia with a company they purchased from AIG. And they were just simply focusing on that area. Then we saw Guardian leave. Guardian wasn't a big player anyway, so no, they didn't raise a whole lot of cane in there. Then Unum discontinued sales. Unum kind of was getting hit with a double whammy here with their long-term disability and their long-term care insurance block. At the same time in 2011, then, the rate increases came. John Hancock, Genworth, the two big boys, the two companies that had held out the longest from taking a rate increase, suddenly was forced into the situation to do so. Genworth, typical Genworth, about a 25% of their block, pretty low increase. Hancock showed us the problem out there when you have a company that waits to take a rate increase. It became multiplicative on them. Result was a much higher rate increase, and it affected a bunch of their block of business. Then late in the year, we watched Aegon start filing out there. Monumental requested a rate increase. Transamerica requested a rate increase. All throughout this, I was kind of optimistic yet saying, you know, this is just normal stuff occurring in the industry. Then all of a sudden, a new topic started being thrown around out there. The concept of rate adjustments. Where companies were coming out and telling us, here's the deal. We think our assumptions are fine. The problem we got is, we don't have enough interest rate return out here to make it here. we got problems here. American Association tried to explain it away to us by saying, realize in our product, it's a long-tailed product, and we demand a lot of that investment rate of return to pay claims. You know, when you look at the fact for a 40 to 50-year-old person, we're sitting out there saying we're expecting over half the money for claims to come from investment income. Even at 65, 30 to 40%. They came out and said for every 1% decline in long-term care rates, excuse me, in investment rates, we're going to see a 10 to 15% increase on in the products back to the day they were priced. Since then, of course, we found out the American Association was a little off on that. In reality, actuaries are now saying 0.5% requires a 10 to 15% increase. So all of a sudden, as the rate adjustments started coming out there, we were rolling into 2012. I still wasn't too shook up about what, what's going on in the industry. Then all of a sudden, 2012, Prudential kind of started things out. They had taken rate increases on their old blocks of business last year. They were the first company to take a rate adjustment out there. They looked like they were a long-term player in our industry. All of a sudden, April 1, they announced they're leaving individual. Then all of a sudden, July, they said, we're leaving long-term care insurance totally. Now, all of a sudden, I had to wake up and go, what's going on here? Then Genworth, they had only implemented 39 states in their last rate increase. Suddenly, they stunned the industry. They came out and announced we were going to make significant changes to producer compensation, 
product and product prices out there. When they announced their changes, they were a pretty shocking set of changes out there. Besides eliminating lifetime 10 pay, pay to 65, they took away the preferred health discount, they reduced couple discount, and they dropped commission 15%. When they tried to address what was going on, they came out and said, hey, here's the deal. We're going to drive new business with improved profitability. That's all there is to it. In long-term care insurance, we're going to be in the market, but we're going to be in the market with a product that is going to focus on a preferred risk selection and we're going to be priced right. Then all of a sudden, Mutual and United Omaha followed them up. Basically, a similar set of changes right down the line. Now, Mutual Omaha tried to soften the blow a little bit. So they said, you know what, we're hoping to give these commission uh, decreases back in about 12 months. Um, and we think this market is still a strong market and we're going to be there for the long term. So I watched that, and I watched the way they were positioning themselves out there. Again, they came back and talked about the fact that the interest rate environment out there was tough on them. Then all of a sudden, American General, they were kind of an interesting company. They weren't a big player out there, but here's the deal. They had just kicked off a new product January 1, 2010. All of a sudden, July 2012, they announced their discontinuing sales. And again, they started talking about the economic feasibility at this time. Then Transamerica came out and announced their changes out there. Then John Hancock came out in August. This was actually the first bit of good news, although I didn't recognize it at the time, when they introduced their new inflation option out there. Then New York Life, another piece of good news came out and said, of course, our sales are going up. We don't know what's happening with the rest of the industry. But you know what? All of a sudden, Agents were starting to ask me questions. What's happening to long-term care insurance? Why are companies doing this? Will this market be there in the future? What should I do as an agent? You know, especially the long-term care professionals out there were really saying, I don't understand what's going on, and nobody's really given us a good explanation of what's happening. That's when I began sitting down and researching and writing this speech. When we look at what happened to long-term care insurance, the return on investments right now, is by far the biggest issue that companies are facing out there. When we look at return on investment, we got to go back to the Great Recession here. What we saw was the Feds, prior to the Great Recession, were trying to get a lot of the people into housing in America. They were keeping interest rates down. Well, then all of a sudden, in 2007, December, when we actually saw it start, the housing bubble had burst, and it kicked off a few things. All of a sudden, Lehman Brothers started triggering a banking panic out there. And all of a sudden, it began to sweep across the entire world economy. You know, if you look at the academic definition of recession, and you recognize it's two or more consecutive quarters of negative growth, we could say that the recession ended in June or July of 2009. But if you use the broad definition, which is what most people use in their mind, which is simply ongoing economic hardship, we're still in a recession out there. In fact, in a poll late last year, over 50% of Americans said we were in a recession, and there were a lot of those that said, nah, we're in a depression out there. So the bottom line is we've been in a tough economic situation here. The Federal Reserve had been doing what it's doing with the interest rates, keeping them low to help the banks, the borrowers, and the home buyers. Now all of a sudden the Federal Reserve started to go a step farther. To try to stimulate the economy again, they started going to a near zero policy. And that near zero policy started to wreak havoc out there. You know, everybody knew up front that this was going to penalize savers, which was going to penalize the seniors out there, etc. In fact, the chairman sat out there and told Congress, we know that we're going to penalize these people, but we have to do it. You know, the federal governor sat there and said, you know, this isn't a very big portion of assets out there. It's only about 7%. Actually, it's far closer to 20% than it is 7%. The bottom line is, is they kind of knew the collateral damage was occurring. But I don't know that anybody thought about the insurance industry that much. The low rates out there, the first effect on us is the long-tail contracts out there. Any contract that I'm writing, like long-term care insurance or long-term disability, when we've got a long tail out there, we're, we're relying on that investment income, that's going to get a, have a big effect on us, okay? But it's going to affect all policies.
Because when we see that interest rate held down, what's being held down? Government bonds, highly rated corporate bonds, other instruments that the regulators want us to invest in out there. As a result, we could see a reduced return on our policy reserves, and that means we might have to start pumping those up. So any company selling life and health insurance has got to be concerned when we see low interest rate environments out there. The bottom line is, is most of the time we can live through a little bit of a lull in the interest rates out there. And that's because we invest in midterm investments, four to seven year investments. And as a result, when we see lower interest rates, typically it takes a while to affect us because we have to roll over our portfolio. We have bonds that are still paying us a higher interest rate of return for up to seven more years, you know. So it takes time for a portfolio to roll. As a result, we might feel it a little bit, but it's something we can normally live through. 2012, all of a sudden everybody started taking a look at this and going, something's wrong. I shouldn't say 2012 either. It's actually late 2011 that companies really started to sit up and take notice. As companies set up to take notice, what they were noticing was the return was continuing to dump here. You know, we've seen over the last year our 10-year treasuries continue to decline. But June of 2012, we saw them hit 1.47%. You know what? That's the first time in the history that we've seen them fall below 1.5%. If you look at the returns out there, this is as of August 24th, you know, a two-year treasury was 0.263. 30-year treasury, 2.7%. Money markets at 0.52. A five-year CD at 1.41%. When you consider the fact an investment-grade bond typically has a 1.5% spread, you can see we've got companies investing money now that are actually investing them at a lower rate of interest than they're guaranteeing in their inflation. That makes it tough out there. And understand this isn't just affecting long-term care insurance. It's sweeping throughout the entire life and health industry. We saw July 3rd, uh, legal and general senior vice president stand up and say, this is the most challenging interest rate environment we've ever faced. And the future right now is the most uncertain we've ever faced. He came right out and said, you know, what? with all this happening out there, we have to make moves here. We have to do something if we want to be in this market for the long term. Even business CEOs are starting to worry right now. Our second quarter results came in, and I have to tell you, they look pretty good. Until you started analyzing them and realizing that the top line revenue was pretty weak. In reality, most companies made that money by cutting costs out there, which means they're cutting labor. You know, when you're thinking about the fact that we're theoretically three years after the recession ended, the opposite should be happening. Now we're looking at corporate America, and we're saying that from the projections we're seeing, our third quarter here could be the weakest quarter we've seen since 2009. So this is really sweeping across all of America. But in the insurance industry, it's especially tough. Because we have capital requirements that require us to base the model on interest rates. We see any type of a prolonged period of low interest rates, it could mean we're going to have to start increasing the capital that we're required to hold. And that means <coughs> that we're going to have to start pumping up reserves. And I'll tell you what, that's going to cut into the capital base a lot. At the other side of the coin, we have to be careful there because we've got to be careful that interest rates don't rise too fast. Whenever a company is rolling its portfolio, like all of our companies are doing right now, the farther you get into that rollover, the higher chance of disintermediation occurring if interest rates all of a sudden rise real fast. You know, we sell products today based on current rates, and when interest rates go up, the market value of the investments we invested to back up these products go down. If we see interest rates rise fast enough, then all of a sudden it's lucrative to clients to start cashing in these products, even if we have surrender charges which could force companies to liquidate investments at a reduced price. This is something that can really affect a company. So companies, this is the real concern out there with disintermediation right now. We have some other financial concerns that have to be looked at. we got Europe over there. 
you know, you, we just saw the bailout of Spain come over there. We've got Greece leaving the Eurozone right now. And a lot of big, our big corporations sell a lot of product over in Europe. We got a lot of insurance companies that have got a lot of exposure, notably Aegon over there right now. And we have to recognize that the best case scenario we can look at for Europe right now is that we're going to see a recession out there. The bottom line is, is that we could see a full-blown blown crisis occur over there. So we got a problem with Europe over there, and that's affecting us in our economy. We have commodity prices that are kind of going bonkers on us out there. Typically, we see low inflation, and that's going to cause lower commodity prices. Then all of a sudden this year, energy started to go up. Then the drought came up. We got food prices starting to go up. All of a sudden, we're seeing all the commodities starting to inch up. At the point in time, they should be inching down. This is going to create a ripple across the economy as these prices continue to rise out there. Then we got China. You know, we always think of China as the country that we make a lot of products in. But in reality, what we've got in China is a new consumer base growing as they're starting to form a middle class out there. And that new consumer base over there buys a lot of products from European and U.S. products out there. When the weak economies cause a reduced demand for their exports, the same thing is coming back to us. On top of that, we got a potential property bubble occurring over there that's going to create and cause people to hunker down a little more. This is a big hit to a lot of companies, especially in healthcare, by the way, where we see a lot of growth in the Chinese marketplace over there. As we watch this occurring, everybody's recognizing the effect that that's having on America. And then, of course, as we all know, we got the fiscal cliff in Washington coming up. You know, what's amazing about this fiscal cliff is we got $1.2 trillion of hikes and spending cuts that are scheduled to go into effect. If they go into effect, the CBO has already warned Congress, we're going to see another recession start right away. And yet, on Capitol Hill, we see absolutely nothing happening. Okay, I mean, we still got the two parties sitting out there debating with each other. It doesn't matter what the other one puts on the table. The other party hates it. I'll tell you what, we've even got Moody's coming out there saying, we're going to start cutting the U.S. again. Last year they cut us the first time, but we're going to cut it again because right now we're looking at Washington saying we're not so sure anything's going to happen over there. You know, it's scary. We got the House Speaker standing up and saying, I'm not confident that Congress can reach any kind of a deal to avoid this downgrade. Why? Because we're not even going to start negotiating until after November elections. You know, it makes an average American sit back and say, what are you guys thinking about up there? we got some major financial problems here, and you guys are sitting there debating this on party lines. All of this is happening out there at the same time. we got some regulatory challenges. You know, a lot of the problems we had in long-term care were created by regulators. In the early days, they mandated that we have set uh, loss ratios out there, and the penalties were set pretty high if you failed to do it. It almost pushed companies to price their products too low. Then, of course, in 2005, they turned the corner exactly and came out and said, we're going to penalize companies that raise their rates out there. And that pushed carriers to say, well, I might as well set our rates as high as we can go so we don't have to raise rates and get penalized for it out there. Then we got companies that are, or states that are sitting out there and starting to stop companies from taking rate increases. All of this has kind of led us up to the current environment. We got a rate draft that's getting put together out in Washington right now that basically tells actuaries, here's how to probably get a rate increase. Some of the debates that we're hearing at this uh, forum is just fascinating. We've got regulators out there saying, you know, if it's due to investment rate return, you know, that should be the company's fault. Okay? The bottom line is we shouldn't let them take a rate increase because their investment rate of return is going down. Now, you know, there's a lot of regulators that are looking at them going, are you nuts? The insurance industry is built upon the fact that they can get a return on their investments out there. But right now, this is kind of sending a little bit of shockwaves across the industry as we're starting to look at this and say, so what are you saying here? You're going to start limiting our ability to get rate increases out there? 
Now we've got a real big problem, and that is that the new model is considering saying that when you come out with it and ask for any rate increase at all, we want that rate increase to be high enough to sustain it over the life of the product. You know, you think about this exactly against the concept of guaranteed renewability out there. We've got states looking at legislation right now that could limit our rate increases. We've got the opposite occurring with the Interstate Insurance Product Regulation Commission that's sitting out there saying, well, we want long-term care companies to true up their rates every year, okay? So we got a lot of hassles going on, a lot of hearings out there on the regulatory side that are kind of making us wonder what's going on here. Are we sure we're going to have the potential here that we can walk out there and get rate increases when we need it? At the same time, we got some other things occurring in the back. And I know I sound kind of negative right now, but I want to tell you, I, I'm going to end this up in a real surprising turnaround here because as I went through this research, I, if you're like me, you're going to reach the end here and say, wow, I never thought he was going to end up like this. We got other disturbing things occurring out there. Milliman just did a study and came out and said, we're seeing that clients who have lifetime benefits or limited pay plans, their average claim duration is higher than the normal policy out there. You know, they don't know why. They're kind of actually debating why. But the fact is, we get a distinct trend occurring. We have an overall slight movement in the trend of claims out there that suggests to us that the claims might be increasing. And we get questions out there regarding life expectancy. There are people out there saying, we maybe have reached the peak of life expectancy, and now we're going to see life expectancy starting to go down. Main reason for that is baby boomers, which is not a very healthy generation of people out there. And we're seeing questions whether improving morbidity is going to continue into the future. All of this kind of solidifies the fact that we're still shooting at a moving target out there. We don't have a stationary target like life insurance does that we can just aim and shoot and be okay. we got a product here that's still evolving out there. And at the same time, as all this is occurring, we're seeing negative press. Companies and articles coming out there going, you know, do insurance companies even want to sell this product? Are they going to be here tomorrow? Should you purchase long-term care? This is a fascinating article because it actually, from its title, sounds like a negative article. In reality, the article was very uh, positive out there. As we watch all this negative publicity, we take a look and step back and say, what's the bottom line? And as I looked at the bottom line, the first thing I saw is returns the biggie out there. We're entering a significant price and benefit adjustment cycle. It's not fun for consumers. It's not fun for producers. But you know what? Standing pat today is unrealistic. Companies can't afford to stand pat. They have to do something. And that something is, do I increase costs? Do I decrease benefits? Or do I get out of the market? And you know, if they're going to stay in the market, they got a real delicate balance here because they can't change their product too dramatically that producers won't sell it or consumers won't buy it. So they got to run a fine line there. If we look at low rates of returns out there and we say, is it going to last? Every bit of indication we're getting right now is that we're going to see low returns for the near future here and potentially into the mid-future here. The bottom line is that low returns out there may last quite a while. Could it get worse? Well, look at Europe right now. There's a real fascinating thing occurring in Europe right now as they're selling bonds to people, that you buy this bond for $100, and it guarantees that two years from now, they'll give you $97. In other words, a negative rate of return. Why would people buy it? Because they feel better facing a 3% guaranteed loss than they do facing a potential 10 or 20% loss. You look at those little charts on there, you can see a lot of the countries in Europe right now have negative returns happening in their economies. So you might say it won't last forever, but you know what? If you are the president of a company, you might say, can you guarantee that? You know, but you're right. The chances are it won't last forever. But think yourself just for a minute. If you were the president of a company that had been around for 150 years 
and you're looking at today's environment, the questions you're asking yourself is, how long is it going to last? Is it going to get worse? If it does get worse, how much worse could it get? How do I deal with this? You know what? Don't let something happen to this company while I'm at the helm. Even if you're top executive, you're saying, don't let something happen to this company while I'm part of the management team. You know, the bottom line is they're looking at what can I do to fix this problem. And remember one thing about insurance executives, they're not risk takers. They're risk managers. You don't become an insurance company head being a risk, well, unless you're uh, Fred Carr, but no, I'm just kidding. You don't become the president of a company being a risk taker out there. You got to be a risk manager. You got to handle this. So if you are running an insurance company and you're looking at this, here's the numbers you're looking at. If I looked at a 40 year old person and I say, I need 212,000 at a point in the future 45 years from now, I can get 6% rate of return on my portfolio, give me a thousand bucks a year, and I can make that 212,000. But what if my interest rate of return is only 5%? At 5%, if you look at the right-hand side, <clears throat> this is, by the way, an LTC CEO uh, calculator. If I look at the right-hand side, I'd have to have $1,332 to match that $212,000. I'd need 33% more premium. Even on a 60-year-old, I'm still looking at 15% to cover a 1% difference in interest rates. Now let's go back to that 40-year-old. Let's look at what a 3% difference would be. If instead of 6%, I only get 3%, instead of bringing in 212, I'm only going to have 92,000 out there. If I take that and turn it around, in order to get that 212,000, I need to have 2,295 bucks compared to 1,000. Now keep in mind all these charts are saying that the interest rate differential would last the entire life of the product. I'm just showing you this so you can get an example of your mind of what insurance executives are looking at. If I look at a 55-year-old, an age that reflects our industry a little bit better, I'm still looking at a 60% difference in the premium. You know, if I'm looking at enforced policies, I might need more than that. But if for new premium, that's what I'm looking at right there. That's the numbers. These are the numbers that companies are looking at right now. Let me give you an actual example, which will show you this a lot cleaner. Let's take a look at American Financial. They stopped selling January 2010. They had 60,000 policies in force. At the end of 2011, all this comes from their SEC filings, by the way. End of 2011, they had 490 million in reserves, which is about 8,200 bucks per policy. They estimate that their current reserves and their future premiums minus claim costs and expenses, they're going to make about $25 million in that. So as long as they can get rate increases for any adverse experience, they're probably okay. The concern is that and what their return on, on investments will be. Take a look at that last bullet point. They figure that excess value of $25 million will drop $10 million for every 1% change in assumptions about claims or 0.1% change in investment yield. Now I'll tell you what, if you're looking at that and saying 0.1% in investment yield is going to drop me $10 million, that means based on my current numbers, I got a profitable book of business. But give me a 3% adverse change in claim costs or 0.3% investment, and I'm going to be sitting there looking at a negative balance. If I get a 1% difference in interest rates, I'm going to lose $75 million. Question, would you buy that block of business? Let me ask you a further question. If they offered to give it to you, would you take it? If you were making decisions on this block of business, what would you do? You know what? Let's take a look at the same situation here and just ask a few questions. Let's assume we got a current company doing business just like our uh, case we just talked about. You know, the first question they got to be asking themselves is, should I stay in the market or not? Now, if they ask themselves, should I stay in the market, that's going to be a pretty easy question for most companies. Why? Because you just admit it in your own mind, you wouldn't even take this company for free. Okay? 
So needless to say, the current situation doesn't create a good selling environment. Their chance of finding a buyer out there that's going to give them a good price is not going to be easy. Chances are they're staying in the market. Next question you got to ask yourselves is should we keep selling? Now, if I have any home office people on this phone call today, please do me a favor. If I misstate your position, just email me and tell me what's really going on. I'll be happy to change my speech, okay? I have had one company that's requested that they not even be named in this speech, and I'm, I'm fine with that, okay? But the fact is, is that I've always been a person that calls it like I see it. So I always tell people, you might not always like what I say, but I'll guarantee you one thing. It's true and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. I don't blow smoke. I call it like it is. If I'm going, should I keep selling? There's a couple things that i got to think about in my mind. If I continue selling, my portfolio return is going to drop faster because my rollover percentage is going to decrease because of that new premium I'm bringing in. If I stop selling, okay, I can get a faster cash flow off of this book of business. We saw that back when we analyzed CNA with in my long-term care insurance premiums, the good, the bad, and the ugly a few years ago. So there's a couple points that I have to think about in my mind. Now, there's a lot of good reasons for a company to say, yeah, I want to stay in the market. First of all, you got companies that are just coming out there saying, we want to be a market leader. You know, that's Genworth, that's United Omaha out there, that's Hancock. They're coming out there and bluntly saying, here's the deal. There's only a select group of long-term care professionals in the United States, and they need product. They can't afford to have companies bailing out just because the interest rate has have gone down here a little bit. So they're making the moves to their product. They've made them fast. They were industry leaders here in that area. And the bottom line is they're saying we're going to be here to stay. Hopefully when this all shakes out in the long term and interest rates come back up, agents will remember that we were there for them during this time. So we got the people that want to be market leaders. We got some companies out there that don't really have a choice. Okay, um, Good example of that would probably be Transamerica. Okay? Tranny out there. They already bailed on us once in the industry, and the bottom line is they don't dare bail on us again right now. They're in here. They're going to stay because they want to be perceived as market leader in the future. Then you got companies that are taking advantage of the situation. Probably a good example of that is Life Secure. You know, bottom line is they're looking just like Jackson National did when Universal Life first came out. They're going, here's our chance to kind of leapfrog over companies and become a market leader. Then you got some companies that are just saying, why not? You know, when you got the why not, you've got the state farms out there, the uh, New York Lifes, the Northwesterns, you know. Either they were priced well from the beginning, so they're not really getting too concerned with what's happening right now, or in the arena of state farm, they're sitting out there going, we don't really care. We don't care if we lose money on this line of insurance. We need a product for our 19,000 agents out there, and... They, we don't want them selling somebody else's product, so we got to have a product in the market no matter what. So those are good reasons for companies to say, yep, we want to stay in the market. If you look at companies that say, should we keep selling? No. Well, there's some good reasons for companies to say no. You know, Guardian was a good example of that. They didn't even have 10,000 policies on the books. Bottom line is they had been in the market five, six, seven years they realized we're not going to build up a real big book of business here. We don't even know if our books actually sound. So basically, let's bail out and concentrate on our core products. You know, that's a good thing for Guardian to do because Guardian's one of the leading life companies in the nation, and they want to maintain that position no matter what. Other companies have a good reason to say no just due to size. You know, I think that's what True and Met did. You know, Prue and Matt looked at this and said, you know what, we got a lot of life and health products here. we got to deal with this interest rate. We're not a big player in long-term care insurance anyway as far as their books of businesses were, not as far as we considered them. Bottom line is, is why not bail out for right now and let the market calm down a little bit. Both companies didn't really care about what agents think because they know. They could dance back into this market five years from now, and agents will still go right for them because of their size. So they don't need to worry about the short-term things here. They can afford to play long-term. These two companies really have an interesting position because they were both heavily in group. And the bottom line is the group market hasn't matured as fast as we hoped it would. 
So they thought, you know what, we could pull out and wait for this market to mature a little bit more before we dance back in. You got some companies coming out there saying, should I enter the market, you know? I forgot about Thrive It when I did the first feature, and I got hammered real fast on that one. The listeners had to email to me, I think, five minutes after the speech, which I appreciate very much. Thrive It, of course, is a company that just said, we're entering the market no matter what. We don't care what the position is. Most companies who are looking at long-term care are going, this market's getting real interesting, and this is a product line we might want to get into. Should we enter the market right now? Not unless we want our heads examined, okay? This is not a good time to walk out there and stick your toes in the water. Let's wait for a couple of years and then we'll rush in. And don't kid yourself, there will be a lot of companies moving into this market as soon as this shakes out. Pricing is the real interesting factor out there because we know right now that our current economic picture isn't good. The fact is, is that our gap is growing between our portfolio rolling over return versus the actual money that we're getting out there and the assumptions that we have in our products. We don't know if it's going to get worse. We don't know how long it's going to last. You know, the safest bet if you were an insurance company would be to say, I better plan on a lower return for the full policy lengths. But I know that would require over a 60% increase, which is what? I'm not so sure I'm willing to do. I got to look at the regulatory issues out there, and I'm looking at rate increases saying the best best case scenario for the future is we're going to have increased oversight. Worst case scenario is we could see states severely limiting us. Safest bet is to assume limited rate increases in the future, and that means we should consider making moves quickly. We have to be careful of rate stabilization because moderately adverse hasn't really been defined yet. But we do know we got to have an 85% loss ratio on any rate increase we ask for. So if we don't and we have to refund, that's going to cost us a lot of money. So we got to figure out a way to take rate increases but not rely on rate increases totally. We got to find other ways to save some money here. Pricing, what's our best strategy? You know what? Number one, plan on a new product, price strong enough to avoid future increases. If we don't have it on the uh, books or, or on the works already, start development of it right now. Uh, as far as our old books business goes, start filing rate increases on all of our closed books. Ease into them because we know that regulators are going to handle them a little bit easier. But don't wait. Get started and get as much as possible there to maintain profitability. Don't assume heavy lapses when you take a rate increase. Past increases have shown that we're going to see less than 5%. Shoot for a 15% return on those products, and let's hope we get some return on them. As far as current products go, our evidence is strong enough on lifetime benefits and limited pays that we should discontinue those immediately. Let's adjust the pricing going forward and try to keep from hurting current clients. Since we don't think this is going to be sufficient to cover everything, let's tighten up underwriting as much as possible. And as a temporary deal, let's cut agents' commissions and use that money to help us get this propped up. Forget about the media concerns right now. Forget about agents. We'll be in a lot worse shape if all of a sudden we reach a point in the future we can't back up our promises. Agents want us to be there. And when I reached the end of writing this slide, I looked at it and said, sound familiar? You know what? This is exactly what's going on in the industry right now. Is our companies are making moves here that when you think about it, they're smart. You know, when I started, I have to be honest with you, I didn't expect to find this conclusion. Honestly, I was buying into greed motivations out there. I thought companies were taking advantage of this to get higher profits. That's what Genwer sounded like. I thought other companies were taking advantage of other companies' movements out there, Genwer following Hancock, etc. I didn't realize the extent of the potential problem here on all lines of insurance. You know, realize it'll never happen, but negative returns have the potential to destroy our industry. A long period of low returns are going to dramatically affect our products. Companies, presidents have a right to be concerned right now. 
they have to react, and they have to react strong because if they want to be there in the future, they got to make these moves. You know, I'll tell you what, the more I looked at this, the more I realized how impressed I was with our industry. Because the good news of all this is companies have shown they're willing and capable to make the moves that they need to do to stay strong. When you judge in your own mind Hancock, Genworth, United Omaha, you know what, take a hard look at them and recognize that they are pioneers out there, they're market leaders out there, and they're making the moves that they had to make to keep their product strong. If the return comes back in five to ten years, you know what, we may have adjusted rates enough here to see uh, true price stability in the future. Our current moves are going to make the products more attractive and they're going to encourage companies to enter long-term care insurance. <clears throat> All of a sudden you get this pricing up there, you know, a lot of companies have been stand, standing by the wayside are going to start looking at this saying when interest rates come back up, this is going to be a real attractive market. And the end of the day is that the need for long-term care insurance is still real. When we go out in the field and we talk to people, we have to realize we're the only buffer that stands between them and poverty. When I go out and talk to a client and I show them the risk of long-term care, the risk of needing it, and the cost of that long-term care, and show them how it can wipe out a lifetime of savings. You know, to me, that's what long-term care insurance is all about. I look at people and go, you know what, you don't build up the assets you do by sitting out there and frivolously spending your money. You sacrifice your entire life. You are the one that said, I'm going to stick money in savings. You are the one that increased your uh, investments out there. You are the one that built your retirement plan. You watched other friends, sometimes family, who didn't do that, who spent their money and now are sitting there at the same age without a whole lot to live on. But you did it. Don't let something like a long-term care situation wipe it out for you. You know what? I don't care if our products are a little bit higher priced. I'm not apologizing for it. I'm going out to clients and saying, I know you and I know you don't want companies to take big rate increases in the future that you maybe couldn't afford in the future. You'd rather they took them now, wouldn't you? And the fact is, you want a company that's going to be there. You want a company that's going to make the right moves. We've already got new concepts, new products that are coming out there to help us solve these problems. Now, the bad news is that the increased premiums is going to cause a certain percentage of people reach the point where they don't think long-term care insurance is affordable. I don't know how big that percentage is, but you know what? Regardless of whether it's small or big, it's there. It's something that we as agents have to deal with. And the increased premiums may make it a little bit tougher decision for some people. Although sometimes I think agents have a tendency to blow this up in their mind. Just realize one thing. Unless your client is aware of the past pricing, it's a moot point. They have nothing to compare it to. All they're doing is looking at your premium. And when I show that insurance is a smart purchase because I'm looking at the cost of that premium versus the potential cost of care, in my mind, I'm looking at it saying that's not as big a deal as we think it is. And I'd rather have a company that did make the moves so I could feel a little bit more comfortable with the rates. Okay. Tightened underwriting is going to increase your declines out there, no question about it. So as we look at this situation as agents and we see what, where we ended up today, the first thing I do is take a hard look at your main carrier. Did they make the moves they should have made to protect themselves? If they haven't, are they making the moves? Okay. I don't want to be writing for a company today that they're sitting out there looking at a rate increase ready to happen. Don't make excuses for your higher prices. All the studies today are telling us that clients are concerned with two things. Number one, that companies are going to take increases that they reach a point they can't afford to keep the policy. And number two is that the company won't be there when they need it. Well, we know the company is going to be there when they need them. What we have to do is tell the client, it's good that our company's made these moves right now because it's strengthened the product up. It also means you got to work smarter. Higher prices are going to affect sales. Tougher underwriting means more declines. So you have to work smarter to go out there and continue to make this commitment. Before I go into this last area, let me tell you something. 
everything that I'm studying today in this, and I'm doing a lot of research continually, is I have a ton of respect for our companies out there. We are making the moves. We're being smart. They're dealing with a very weird environment right now with investment returns, and they have to address that. And that means we're going to continue to see adjustments by the companies that haven't done so already. However, I'm pretty confident that the companies who have made the moves, assuming that we see interest rates come back within the next four to five years, have made sufficient moves in order to keep themselves sound. We as agents have to do the same things. We have to start making moves here to keep ourselves sound. And one of the ways to do this is to bring yourself out there and take a look at a new product that we've introduced into the market. Teamed up with GTL, Guaranteed Trust uh, Life out of Chicago. Tell you what, they're a great company. They're a niche carrier out there. We have been working with them on our career shop for the last uh, six, seven years, and we've been very happy with them. We've been happy with all aspects of them. And we've been working with them the last couple of years to design a product that takes advantage of the current situation out there. Actually, what we've do, done is take a critical illness policy. we built benefits in it for people that face long-term care situation. We pay increased benefits in assisted living or in a nursing home environment. And it pays on a monthly basis like a long-term care policy. So it's got a lot of features that make it look like long-term care, but it's actually a critical illness plan. It covers your clients against the major risk factors they have out there. In fact, it's going to pay more claims than a long-term care insurance policy will pay in a similar, in a normal situation out there with a normal client. So it's a great alternative to long-term care insurance. Right now what we're seeing is this policy, because it's critical illness, it's got lighter underwriting, we're issuing 98% of the policy or the apps that have been sent in so far to the best of our knowledge. And I'll tell you what, it's a great application, four and a half pages long five questions for health, and I'll tell you what, the average turnaround is three days. This is a product that's easy to explain, and it's easy to sell. And I have to tell you, if you're in long-term care insurance, and you're a long-term care insurance professional, you have to have critical care in your portfolio. You need it. I know this is a new product to our industry. I know it's very revolutionary out there, but keep in mind one thing. We're the largest agency in the nation that sells long-term care insurance. We've sold over $600 million of premium right now. We know this market, and we know this product is your solution and your answer for the problems that our industry is facing right now. Tomorrow, or today is uh, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Tuesday. Tomorrow at Wednesday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we have a webinar called Critical Care, What Is It? Thursday morning, we have a webinar that's called Critical Care, How to Sell It. I would push you, if you haven't seen Critical Care yet, get on this webinar tomorrow, get on the one Thursday, and find out how you can turn your declines into gold out there. And you'll also find out, if you're not willing to sell this product, I'll tell you what, we'll go a step farther, and we'll actually buy your declines from you, because we're confident enough that we have people here that can market to these people and get them covered with this new plan. So do me a favor and make sure you jump on that webinar. Tomorrow we'll be going back to our normal state of the industry webinars, but keep uh, in mind tomorrow we have an introduction to internet selling. And uh tell you we've got a lot of good webinars out there for you to take advantage of. I want to thank each and every one of you very much for coming into this webinar. I appreciate you taking the time. I'm sorry, I know that today's webinar was going to go about an hour, and I'm going to open it up for questions yet, but I want to really push it. As you look at long-term care insurance today, you realize this is still a real positive market. It's a great market to be involved in, and it's a great market right now. So stay out there and keep punching away at them. At this point, I'll open it up for questions. All callers are unmuted. All callers are unmuted. Does anybody have any questions about what I covered today? Pretty typical. Everybody's in shock, actually, by the end of my web this webinar because we go in-depth into a lot of areas. Remember that you can get a copy of today's slides at www.ltcagentsalestools.com. 
If you want to email me with any questions or comments, you can do so at markr at goldencareusa.com. Otherwise, this is Mark Rand saying thank you again for attending. I wish you all a great week selling and a great 2012. Bye, everybody.